Well, hello there, everyone. We're coming to the Feast of Tabernacles as I deliver this sermon. It's a brand new sermon, same title perhaps as one I gave before, but some differences in this one. So don't listen to the old one, listen to this one in uh, Mark 2023. It's about how the Feast of Tabernacles shows how much God the Father and Jesus Christ love to be in the company of their family. They love it just like you do with your family, especially if there's a good relationship going with your family. His desire is to tabernacle, booth with, live with, dwell with mankind. So if you're keeping God's divine appointments, remember one of the main words uh, translated as feast is moed, moedim in the plural, feasts. Another word is chach, C-H-A-G. Say chach sameach or chach sameach. Uh, that's a feast with water and drink and food and, and happiness and all that. that that's the, the typical thing we think of a feast. But moed is a divine appointment with God. So if you're keeping that appointment he made with you to show up and be in front of him, then I think you'll be happy with this sermon to see how much he enjoys that. Also remember, when we come to keep God's holy days, those of you in charge of the Sabbath services, which is also a moed, and the regular holy days, uh, if, if you've announced services begin at 9.30, begin right on the dot at 9.30. God's there waiting. Don't make him wait for his appointment. 10 o'clock, same thing, whether people are there or not. Start on the dot. Be on time. The morning sacrifices were always at the right time, specifically, sp precisely. Now, you who only use notes, I just want to remind you that you're probably missing a lot of what's being said because so, especially when I go into stories or, or things. In fact, most of what I just said is not in my notes unless I put them in. So I would recommend that you listen to the audio uh, and with some notes as well beside you or the computer on. <clears throat> I've been to 56 of these feasts now since 1966. I'd grown up in the Philippines, so we couldn't go to the feast or I would have, I was baptized in my mother's womb, so to speak. My mom was baptized when I was in her womb. Uh, so all my life, I've been exposed to this, picturing the time ahead when God will live among mankind on the earth and uh, enjoying every bit of it. I grew up in the Philippines, like I said. My mom and dad soon divorced after 1966, a horrible time for me. I had migraine headaches going on at the, at the time. But what I did look forward to, we got to the States, United States, around March or April or so of 1966. So our first feast was that September, or whenever it was, that in the beautiful Squaw Valley, they've renamed it now, uh, but it, it, Squaw Valley on the shores of beautiful Lake Tahoe in uh, Northern California, uh, near the border with uh, Nevada. Beautiful, beautiful place. And it was so much fun going up. We, as we were driving up, now all this part's not in my notes. <laughs> So as we were driving up, we were given in those days a green sticker you'd put on your bumper sticker so that as we got near the feast or into the parking area, uh, our people knew, yeah, this is a member of that church and they're coming to keep the feast with us. And as we got closer and closer and closer, we saw more and more of these cars with those bumper stickers. It was exciting. Ministers had a different color and so on. But anyway, uh, so beautiful. Then... First, when we got there, the first thing we did was try to find our A-frame rental that we were going to have the feast in. What a beautiful time it was and near the lake or on the lake and uh, grabbing a bite for dinner, be, not trying to be late and knowing that there were many, many church people among the people in the restaurant. It was just a load of fun. I was 13 years old, just come back from the Philippines. I had a strong Filipino accent. What a great feast it was. And then if it started, let's say, around 7.30 that night, which I think it probably did, <clears throat> the um, song leader got up, and we were all in good attention, ready to begin. And he said, good evening, everyone. Welcome to the Feast of Tabernacles. And then he said, would you all please rise and turn to page, and he would t say the page number, and let's sing together praises to our God as we open up the Feast of Tabernacles. And I found it so exciting. Uh, I might have been crowds of 30 or 40 people before, but, or 100 people. But man alive, there were about seven or 8,000 people, at least that many there. 
And when we began to all sing together, what a wonderful sound and joyful noise. And I was excited. Even as a 13 year old, I could barely sing. I was so excited. Well, anyway, so we were excited also because back then, in 1966, we thought we were just less than a decade to the return of Christ. Does that sound familiar too? I know I, in my heart, feel we're within a decade even now, but I, I hesitate to say it dogmatically because uh, God will come when he will send Christ. He will send, he'll send Christ when he'll send Christ. We thought back then he would come in 1975. And now here, 48 years later, in 2023, we're still here. We're still coming to feast. We're still hoping he comes any day now. And I hope we're as excited about God's feast today, I'm giving this in 2023, as we would have been back in 1966 or whenever you began. So, remember, Christ will come when Father decides. Let's be sure we're ready for him when he comes, desiring, wanting to be there and to live forever with him, forever and ever and ever. Quite a concept. And I'll show it's always been God's desire to tabernacle with man. Now, how long does he want to, how long does God want to tabernacle, to live with you and me and humanity? Now, I don't know about you, but I think most of us, if we're honest, we might have a best friend. We might have people we really enjoy and they want to come visit us. And so we say, sure, come on over. And they're planning to stay for two or three days or four days or five days. And uh, or maybe just one day or maybe just the, the, the day itself. I think most of us feel like Mark Twain once said that uh, people and fish begin to stink after three days. <laughs> Something like that. Uh, does God feel that about you and me that, well, I'll be with you for a while, but a thousand years forever and ever. Yeah, he actually does. Now, those we really value those we really, really are close to. Uh, yeah, we don't mind spending time with them, like your wife, your husband, especially if you have a real good relationship there, or your children, your grandchildren. Uh, but even grandkids, after a while, it's time for them to go home and get back to your normal routine. So for God to want to spend eternity with you and me, eternity, must mean that he really values us. I mean, are we valued? If you wonder how valuable you are, look how hard Satan tries to get you to sin and move away, away from God. Look what price God the Father paid for me and for you. The death of his son, who also was part of the plan. He agreed to it. It was his choice as well, he said. He said, no man has taken this from me. I lay down my life of myself. I think that's somewhere in John 10. But anyway, so of course you're valuable, okay? Now that is love. The price paid for you, man alive, that's love. So the Feast of Tabernacles, many believe, pictures the 1,000-year millennium. It's not a, a, a belief everyone shares, but I think I believe that too, and most of you do, I think, hearing this. The 1,000-year reign of Jesus Christ when he lands on the earth, when he comes back to earth, he's going to rule on the earth. There's major religion that says there's nobody alive left left alive here on earth uh, during the millennium the uh, people are up in heaven They're, the only ones on earth are satan and his de and his demons uh, th that's just so wrong i'll have to give a talk on just that specific point to prove that this reign is on the earth revelation 5:10 you shall be a kings and priests on the earth daniel 2 the the the, the statue was hit by a stone from god and it filled the whole earth Earth, Zechariah 14, all these people are commanded to come and worship at the feast. And if Egypt doesn't come up, they have no rain and so on. It's the earth, the earth, the earth. Isaiah 2, Micah 4. Okay, we'll talk about it more later. So all that will be happening right here on the earth. Some people have called it from time to time the world tomorrow or the world ahead. But I caution you even right now, so many of you call the millennial reign of Jesus Christ the kingdom of God. It's reigned and ruled over. It's ruled over by the kingdom of God. Absolutely true. 
But is it the final, all polished up, finished kingdom of God? 1 Corinthians 15, 50 says, Flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. Cannot. The lion and the lamb, the little child leading them, the nations coming up to Jerusalem, those are all flesh and blood. So it's ruled by the kingdom of God, but it's not yet the full reality of what happens when all heaven and earth is burned up and we have a new heavens and new earth and the heavenly Jerusalem comes down to this new earth, this new planet. Uh, that's the, uh, and there's nothing flesh alive. I mean, how can flesh survive a big mass fire? It destroys the whole universe, as Peter explains. So again, the kingdom of God is not made of flesh and blood. The kingdom of God is entirely spirit. I personally believe the entire universe will be spirit. That's the real matter, the real material thing. So I shouldn't call it matter, I guess, but spirit. And I believe heavenly Jerusalem, streets and gates and walls are all spirit, where there's no corruption, there's no moth, there's no rust or decay. Jesus said that. Okay? So at the feast, anyway, another concept I want to bring up here. At the feast, we live in temporary quarters, like the booths that the Israelites came out of Egypt in, or like the tents or motels or hotels. Some of you, I know in Kenya, we just can't afford motels for families. Just the money's not there. <clears throat> they don't have the money. Most people live hand to mouth, and there's just no money left, even for save, saving things up. And so we have a couple rooms set for the men to sleep in. We got mattresses for them to lay on the floor. And then a couple of rooms for the women to sleep in. Talk about temporary nature of your accommodation. I'm sure they'll be looking forward to getting back to their own homes. But they're excited to come to the feast. And by the way, if any of you would love to help support us, support the feast in Kenya, about 500 or more people, please, please do so. We really could use the help. But anyway, <clears throat> Feast of Tabernacles was to remind Israel, Leviticus 23, 43, how they, when they left Egypt, they lived in goatskin tents. And uh, there was to be a holy day on the first day of the feast, the seven-day Feast of Tabernacles, and a holy day on the next feast, which was the eighth day, not part of the Feast of Tabernacles. Remember the dates that we talk about the 15th of the seventh month, that's talking about the Hebrew calendar. Most years, the feast is in mid-September to sometime early October, when it starts anyway. So God told Moses about those holy days, his divine appointments in Leviticus 23. The first day was a holy day and the last, the eighth day, not the last day of the feast, but the eighth day was also a holy day. The picture I get, the boost and all this, is temporariness. That God is saying, as I bring you to your promised land, not what became Israel and Palestine, as they call it today. No, that's which is a name I don't like to use because it's not a biblical name. But anyway, the promised land, let's just call it that. That it's temporary. You're in boost before you get to the permanent houses and streets and cities that I'll give you in the promised land. So the same thing here, a huge part of the meaning of the feast is temporariness. Our life on earth is temporary. The word it's, you know, um, the universe is temporary. It's going to all be burned up and dissolved, destroyed, replaced. Our bodies are temporary. Peter, let's post it here. Peter, 2 Peter 1, 13 and 14 says that as long as I'm in this tent, he means his body, to stir you up by reminding you, knowing shortly, I must put off this tent, just as the Lord Jesus Christ showed me. He's gonna, he was going to die probably by crucifixion, prophesied by Jesus himself. In uh, the end of the book of John, where he said, when you were young, you know, you could dress yourself, go where you wanted, but the time's coming, someone else will take you someplace you don't particularly want to go, but you have to. And you will, and he was probably crucified. And then Paul also talked about how our bodies are temporary. 2 Corinthians 5.1 1. 
probably on the screen, 2 Corinthians 5.1, we know that our earthly house, this tent is destroyed. We have a building from God, a building, not a tent, a house not made with hands, but eternal in the heavens. So the body we're going to get is eternal, immortal, spirit, cannot die. Revelation 20, verse 5 and 6 says, those in the first resurrection cannot die. The second death can't touch them. Okay? Because they're resurrected, like Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15, this mortal must put on immortality. Okay? This corruptible must put on incorruption. We can't, we can't die. We can't dissolve into dust anymore once we're changed. So even now still, we live through very temporary life. Uh, even in our tense right now, a very temporary physical life, waiting for the spiritual one. So even the millennial rule of Christ is temporary. It's going to end. And when it ends, he's going to hand it all over to God the Father. 1 Corinthians 15, around verse 20 to 28. Until the last enemy to be conquered is death. So once death is conquered, then it's handed over to God the Father. And we get a new planet, new universe, and everything like that. So you'll see as we progress through this sermon that God wants to live in a permanent state, in a permanent city, in a permanent universe. No temporary stuff after that. So that's a lesson we're learning as we come to the feast. Life is temporary. And you know that, and you hope so. If you're in pain or getting old, you just as soon let the new life come at some point. You know, what a beautiful time it is. Just got a note from one of our translators that he just had a, they just had a brand new baby today. Well, congratulations, congratulations, protest. So, when is Jesus coming? When's all this gonna, when, when's this temporariness gonna start to end? I say that because there's still a thousand years of temporariness. The millennium is temporariness. The line of the Lamb, it's all temporary. Luke 12, verses 35 to 40 in the New Living. Luke 12, verses 35 to 40 in the New Living says, Be dressed for service. Keep your lamps burning. Not like the ten virgins. All of their lamps went out. They all fell asleep. All ten, just before the wedding. It's a warning for all of us. Keep your lamps burning as though you're waiting for your master to return from the wedding feast. Then you'll be ready to open the door. Let him in the moment he arrives and knocks. The servants who are ready and waiting for his return will be rewarded. I tell you the truth. He himself will seat them, put on an apron, serve them as they sit and eat. Can you imagine being served by Jesus Christ? He did wash feet in John 13, remember. There's coming a time in the future we'll see him serving food, like a waiter, which is the meaning of diakonos, deacon, table waiter, servant. He may come, verse 38, in the middle of the night or just before dawn. I think the, I think the original Greek says in the second or third watch, which would be very, very early in what we call the morning, before the, the, the dawn. But whenever he comes, he'll reward the servants who are ready. Are you ready for him to return? Are you ready for the millennium to be set up? Understand this, verse 39. If a homeowner knows exactly, knew exactly when a burglar would be coming, he would not have permitted his house to be broken into. You also must get ready. No, no, no. Not get ready. You also must be ready. You hear the difference? Right now, be ready. Because my next moment of life could be my last moment. I could have a heart attack, a stroke, something. Be ready all the time, for the Son of Man will come when least expected. Our job is to be ready, be found busy doing His work, preaching the good news to the whole world, making disciples of people we talk to and come to know who respond, turning families back together, fathers turning their hearts to the sons. I've been doing that too, and I've been trying my own family to be better at that. Um, turning hearts of the fathers to the children, and to make ready a people prepared for their master. That's in Luke 1, 17. 
preparing the bride of Christ, in other words, preparing a people. In other words, once we help get the message out there, then we have to help groom the church. The church is the brethren, the people, the ecclesia, the people, not the building. So we are found to be so doing great. Luke 12, verses 42 to 44, very strong language. It's not a time to be primarily partying and having a great time. It's not wrong to have a great time, but certainly don't be getting drunk. Don't be out there womanizing. Don't be unfaithful in our marriages. I'll focus on the first verses um, here. Luke 12, 42 to 44. And the Lord said, this is Jesus, who then is that faithful and wise steward whom his master will make ruler over his household. Verse 43, blessed is the servant whom his master will find busy, will find so doing. Busy doing the master's work. I tell you, I say to you that he will make him ruler over all that he has. So we must be busy doing God's work. Busy getting the word of God out. Helping the world see that Jesus is the son of God that he died for us and was resurrected for us, that we must believe in him, like John 6, 29. He returns when we're not expecting him. So whenever I start seeing a whole bunch of people saying, including me sometimes, that probably 2030, 2031, there's another side of me that's saying, well, then, then it's probably not then, because he will return at a time we are not expecting him. Luke 12, 46 says. So I hope we're getting excited to know that every day that passes is a day we're getting closer than ever. And when will be the time of his return? It's up to God, the Father. He'll send Christ back when he's ready to dwell with mankind on the earth, to rule the earth and teach everyone God's ways. Look at Matthew Matthew 1, 21 to 23. This was what was told to Joseph. who was getting concerned. Why is my betrothed Mary pregnant? And he's explaining in the dream to Joseph. Matthew 1, 21 to 23. And she will bring forth a son. Call his name Jesus. That's Yeshua in Hebrew. I'm sure he said Yeshua in Hebrew if they were talking in Hebrew. For he will save his people from their sins. He will save people. That's what Yeshua means. Savior. Salvation. So all this was done, verse 22, that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the Lord through the prophet, saying, Behold, the virgin shall be with child and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which means, which translated, God with us. God with us. This is what the Holy Days is all about. God showing us how he's going to send Jesus Christ to live with mankind again, just like it was before when Adam and Eve, before they had sinned in the Garden of Eden. God enjoys being with his people. God enjoys being with his creation. Living with us is made possible by Jesus' life shed for us. To bring us back in relationship, in reconciliation with God. He will save people from the thing separating them from God, from their sins. And God is with us again. Emmanuel is the result. Now our God, I want to say this, is very different from the gods, the pagan gods. Whether we're talking Inca, Incas, Mayas, um, the, the Greeks or the Egyptians or whatever. The ancient pagan gods were said to live in the high mountains or under the sea or under the earth and up in Mount Olympus or someplace else on a peak. They didn't particularly want to be with human beings unless Zeus was trying to seduce somebody again. He was married to his own sister, Hera, totally unfaithful to her. But these pagan gods wanted to be by themselves. They wanted to be appeased. It was not uncommon. I know in Central America for the Aztecs and the Incas to have to offer human sacrifice to their gods. Humans. And they didn't care for humans, really. 
But if they were pleased, they might send crops, the god Ceres, where we get cereal. If you please them, there were terrible fights and horrible things that they did to each other. <clears throat> These gods did. You certainly can, could not use them as an example of the way you wanted to be. You wouldn't have verses about follow me as I follow Zeus. Uh, Zeus was terrible. They all were terrible. Womanizing, very common with Zeus. Fifty-four children at least were born through Zeus because of Zeus, including Helen of Troy. Remember Helen of Troy? Some say as high as 92 children. He impregnated 12 earthly women, according to the mythology. Totally unfaithful to Hera, his wife and sister. But our God's different. Our God is holy and righteous and wants to help us. Instead of us sacrificing to him human lives, no, he forbade that. He sacrificed his son for us. What a God. He doesn't hold the grudge, but forgives upon repentance. Incredibly patient with all of us. So he's been terribly patient with me, horribly, horribly, uh, I mean, greatly patient with me. Turn now to Isaiah 46, verse 9 and 10. What I'm about to read, if you grasp it, God's saying that you'll understand the end better by understanding the beginning. Because, he says, the end is declared from the beginning. Remember the former things of old, for I am God, there is no other. Isaiah 46, 9 and 10. I am God, there is none like me. Declaring, or the NIV says, I will make known the end from the beginning. And from ancient times, from ancient times, the things that are not yet done. Okay, so one way we can understand where God's taking us is to see what he did in the beginning. Let me start with you. How do you like being with people? I already said before that for many of us, two or three, four days is fine. That's, that's great. But then after that, yeah, let's get back to our routine. Normally, if you have a really good wife or husband who is a soulmate and you love being together and you just have a lot of fun, yeah, you could be with someone like that for a long, long time. Although many marriages end in divorce because it doesn't always work out that way. Um, but you can live a long time with a husband or a wife, look forward to being with brothers and sisters for a day or two and have fun. Grandkids are usually an extra uh, joy. My brother used to have a bumper sticker saying, if I knew how much fun grandkids were, I would have skipped having kids and gone straight to grandkids. So, <laughs> of course, he knew you have to have kids first. He loved his kids too, and I love my kids, but grandkids are special. Anyway, remember Genesis 46, 19. He says, God will make known the end from the beginning. Let's go back to the beginning. Genesis 1. Verse 24, 25, God spoke the creatures into existence. He just spoke the word and it happened. And at the end of day five, it's declared as a good day. It was all good. And then in Genesis 1, 26 to 28, Elohim in Hebrew, plural for God, translated gods when not referring to the one true God, Okay, but Elohim says, let us, us, make mankind or man in our image and likeness. The word there for man is Adam, by the way. Sometimes it's about the literal man, Adam. Sometimes it's about mankind, including women. So God created male and female in his image and likeness. And this was the sixth day of creation. And they were told to be fruitful and multiply. This would be the end of the sixth day, coming just before the eve, sundown of the seventh. Yes, it's wonderful for a husband and wife to make love on the Sabbath after sundown. Yes, that's fine. That's what basically Adam and Eve are told. As far as I know, no other creature is made in the image of God or after his likeness. Genesis 1, 31, Then God saw everything that he had made. Behold, it was very good. Very good. And so the evening and the morning were the sixth day. 
So when he made mankind, especially at this point, Eve, the end of the day, it was very good. And then he backtracks in Genesis 2, going back a ways. With mankind, God did not speak mankind or Adam into existence. Adam was created first, Eve later, as a part came out of him. He hand-formed the man, Adam, outside the garden. A lot of people don't pick up on this. Outside the garden. There was Eden, a bigger area, and then there was the Garden of Eden, which I've always felt was probably very close to where the Temple Mount is today. Forget about the rivers and all that, because with Noah's flood and all that, the whole geography changed dramatically. But it says he blew, not just breathed, he blew the breath of life into the nostrils of Adam. Could have been the spirit in man, perhaps. I know of no other creature which says God blew into their nostrils. He just said, let the creatures come out of the earth, and they did. Okay? And then he brought Adam into the Garden of Eden from outside. We have to be invited into God's holy presence. Genesis 2, verses 7 and 8. Then the Lord God, Yovai Elohim, formed man of the dust of the ground and blew, breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. Man became a living being. Then the Lord God planted a garden eastward in Eden, and there he put the man whom he'd formed. There he put the man. He was from outside. Now he puts him into the garden. And you know what happens. Um, Adam is put there to tend the garden, to keep it. And then he told him about the, the trees. You can eat of all the fruit here, but not that one tree there. Not that one. Try doing that with a two or three-year-old. You can play with all these toys, but not that one. And then uh, watch and see what happens when they don't know you're looking. Eve was not present yet. Eve did not hear these rules except from Adam, or maybe later from God. God showed Adam the animals, and in the context, it was to show Adam that he needed a companion. Like these animals, the lion had a lioness, and so on. And the mallard duck had a female duck. In Genesis 2.20, but for Adam, no companion was found. Genesis 2.20. Okay. Um, because in the beginning there, in Genesis 2.18 to 20, the Lord God, Jehovah God, said, It is not good that man should be alone. It is not good that man should be alone. I will make him a, a azer, a Hebrew, a helper comparable to him. Women are not the only azer. Do you know God is called azer as well? God is my help. Same word. And that is exactly what the name Eliezer means. God is my help or helper. And so verse 19 and 20, God had Adam named the animals. In the end, there's nothing found for him. And then God did the first surgery, put Adam out cold and took out from his side. I know that it says the rib, but the, the word rib there means really bone and flesh from the side that God took out. And he built a woman. Genesis 2, 21 to 25. He brought her to Adam and told them to multiply. See, God knew what he was doing. He knew he had to have, have Adam name the animals before he brought this beautiful naked woman in front of him. <laughs> anyway, um, but now, yeah, now he can focus on Eve and all that, or Hava in the he Hebrew. He told them to multiply. And this is the first instance God's enjoying being with and living with among his people. And at least up till this point. I don't know how long this lasted. That uh, God would come and walk in the garden in the cool of the day, chat with them, be with them, probably seen by them. This particular one would have been the one we know as Jesus Christ. And it appears they talked, walked and talked regularly. So in the beginning, God spent time with mankind, enjoyed it. It's in the beginning that way. And then what happened? We come to Genesis 3, and you know the story. It says that the serpent was more uh, slippery than, by slippery I mean in 
conduct and what he said, appearing perhaps as a shining bright serpent. Because we're told in 2 Corinthians eleven fourteen that he can present himself as an angel of light. I think it's very probable, just like Moses was had this aura of brightness about him because he was in the presence of God. I think it's very possible that Adam and Eve had that, and God had that in the very beginning. We're not told that. I'm speculating. But especially so, if that were the case, then, he, then uh, Satan, the serpent, would have come as an angel of light, I'm sure. But anyway, both were present in Genesis 3, 6, and Adam was there with her, okay? So when the woman saw the tree was good for food, compare that to 1 John 2, 16, the lust of the flesh, good for food, I'm hungry. That looks like a really good fruit there. That it was pleasant to the eyes. Okay, that's the lust of the eyes. 1 John 2, 16. And a tree desirable to make one wise, the pride of life. Wow, I can be just like God, knowing good and evil. I can fill my stomach that's hungry. And I enjoy seeing all the beauty around here. So anyway, she also gave to her husband with her. A lot of people think it's just Eve there. No, no, Adam was right there. He wasn't saying or doing anything, and he knew better. Then the eyes of them were both open, and they knew they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves coverings. Once, when Eve took of the bite, God was more lenient, because we're told in John 9, what is it? I think it's John 9, 41, where he says to the Pharisees, now that you say you're not blind, now that you say you see, your sin remains, because if you said if you really were blind, you would have no sin, but now you do. John 9, 41. Go back and read it. Once Adam ate of it and sin was counted, could it be that the brilliance that they had bangs disappeared from them if they had the brilliance? And now for the first time they can see they're naked. Why couldn't they see they were naked before? Anyway, I think that's my speculation anyway, and I think it's possible. Then the eyes of them were open, and they knew they were naked, verse 7, Genesis 3, 7, and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves coverings. So probably as usual, God came walking in the garden in the cool of the day, verse 8, and they heard him coming around. They heard the sound of the Lord God, Yehovah Elohim, the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and Adam and his wife, Adam just comes from Adama, the dirt, the ground, by the way, hid themselves from the presence of the Lord, from the presence of the Lord, God, among the trees of the garden, first hide and seek. They had sinned. Separation was about to follow. They had to be thrown out of the garden. But before the Creator does that, He sheds some blood, an animal, an innocent animal, probably a sheep or goat or something, probably sheep, and made a real covering of skin, pointing to this promised seed that God had mentioned in Genesis 3, verse 15. You will have a seed. God didn't say when or how long it might have been. She might have thought that this was Cain. Maybe he was spoiled. Maybe they thought he would be the seed. Or maybe, maybe he was Abel, and so Satan inspired Cain to kill Abel. But this was a real covering that God gave, and I'm sure God explained, you'll be able to at some time, your descendants, and you'll be able to be reconciled with me. And we will have a new garden. But it's in way in the future. So Genesis 3.17, for Adam and his wife, God made tunics of skin and clothed them. Then they were expelled from the garden back into the land where God had taken Adam from. And then they had children. Notice Genesis 4, verses 1 to 5. But God still, in spite, he's so kind and so patient. They've rebelled against him, but he's still willing to work with them. Now Adam knew his wife. And she conceived and bore Cain and said, I've acquired a man from the Lord. 
Then she bore again, this time Brother Abel. I want you to notice something. Every other time you look this up, when a woman has more than one child in the Bible, whether immediately or whether, um, my point is, if they're not twins, you always have the word conceive before the second one. So she bore again, this time Brother Abel. It should have said, if they weren't twins, then she conceived again, and this time the brother Abel. It's perfectly conceivable to me, using the word, that God would have had her have twins many times to bring the population up. So they probably, Cain and Abel, there's no second conception here, just twice bearing them, probably Cain and Abel were twins. Again, we have to speculate a bit because it doesn't say that, but I think it's very possible with the missing word conceived here. Abel was a keeper of sheep. Cain was a tiller of the ground. And in the process of time, it came to pass. Now that phrase, in the process of time, it tends to point to something, a special time. Maybe looking forward to like a Passover time season or whatever. It's not just, it does, it's not just saying that over time... Blah, blah, blah. No, in the process of time, at a specific time, it came to pass that Cain brought an offering of the fruit of the ground. Abel brought the firstborn of his flock, and, and the Lord respected Abel and his offering, but not Cain and his offering, until Cain got jealous and angry. Now look at what God does, verse 6. So the Lord said to Cain, Why are you angry? And why has your countenance fallen? If you do well, will you not be accepted? If you do not well, you're about to sin. Sin lies at the door. And its desire is for you, but you should rule over it. You should have some self-control. Anyway, you know the rest of the story. My point in showing you that is the gentleness of God. He hadn't killed Abel yet. But God is taking the time to tell Cain, hey, get a hold of yourself. You're about to do something terrible. Anyway, God continued to appear and work with mankind, Enoch, Noah, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. Jacob wrestled with God, changed his name to Israel. God did. Prince with God. In Genesis 32, 28. And all through the Old Testament, we see the word of God appearing and saying things. Sometimes what the word of God, when he would have come or appeared to or came to, what was said was quite long. And I really believe that many times when we read about the word of God came to Jeremiah, word of God came to Ezekiel. Sometimes it says appeared to, I think, well, anyway, came to, for sure. That those would be times when they saw the one who would become Jesus Christ. Now, this nation... You know, they, uh, 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 the children of Jacob ended up going to Egypt because of the famine. And uh, they lived in Goshen. It's a terrible time of famine. They became slaves eventually. God restated his covenant with them that he had made with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, or Israel, by freeing them from slavery and taking them towards the promised land. What happened first, though? They had been sinners. They had to be reconciled. So how, do, how, do, how does that happen? Exodus 12, let's read it in verse 13, talking about the Passover and the blood splashed on the doorposts and lentils. Now the blood shall be a sign for you on the houses where you are. And when I see the blood, I will pass over you. I will pass over you where we get the word Passover. And the plague shall not be on you to destroy you when I strike the land of Egypt. So God's saying, when I come through with the 10th plague to kill all the firstborn, you won't have to worry about it as long as you take some blood of a lamb, splash it on the doorpost, pointing to the real lamb of God, his hands to the side, which would be along the sides of the door, his head up against the with it all bloodied on his head, that pictured the cross of Christ. It really did. 
And so he says, accept that. And when I see the blood, that's good enough. It's enough. I'm not going to look house to house and say, is their marriage perfect? Is their child rearing perfect? Have they quit lying? Are they keeping Sabbath? They hadn't even told about Sabbath yet at this point. Not yet. And anyway, my point is, no, it's not what they did that made them acceptable to God. It was coming under the blood of God, under the blood of the Lamb, picturing God, picturing the Son of God. Okay, now that has not changed. That's still the same. This is how the world, the whole world, will be reconciled to God, the Son, little by little, not all at once. The world we're going to inherit. Excuse me, i got to write that down. I, I want to write a blog on that. The world we're going to inherit is not going to be real pretty. It's not going to be Shangri-La. It's not going to be Garden of Eden. It's going to be a mess, total mess. It's going to take time to restore it. And the people will be against us, fighting us. They fought Christ when he returned. and We'll, we'll, we'll be with him. This is how the world will be reconciled with God over time, pictured by the Day of Atonement, just before the millennium starts, that he will be able to tell them that you can have the same atonement and be reconciled back to me as my bride was. And then God reconciles and they come and live together during the millennium. Little by little, the nations will be reconciled. It's not a time of severe judgment so much as a time of reconciliation. So the 10 days of awe that some Hebrew roots people follow and believe from Judaism, I don't. I don't. It's a time of reconciliation and, and thankfulness to God. 10 days of awe. You want to be ready for atonement so that you can be acceptable to God for another year. No, no. We want, to be, we want to be acceptable to God the rest of our life when we take the life, the blood of Jesus Christ over us. Not just one year. So when we accept Yeshua as our Savior and we ask for His blood, His life to be shed for us, then we can be reunited with God. It's not all our perfect works that reunite us. It's not. It's our faith in the blood of Christ who can wash away all of our sins, 1 John 1, verse 7, 9, and 1 John 2, verse 1 and 2. I use these verses so many, so many times, I won't turn there now. I pray you don't sin, 1 John 2, but if you do, you have Jesus Christ the righteous, who will make atonement, propitiation for our sins. Okay? So even sins that are yet future, as 1 John 2 explains, they're all covered by Christ. And even when we sin now, once we accept the blood of Christ, now we will be rewarded by our works. What we'll be doing for all eternity will depend on how much we overcome and work for God. But salvation itself, salvation itself, once we accept the blood of Jesus Christ over us, now there's no condemnation to those who are in Christ. Paul said that right after he had been saying in Romans 7, that he still sins sometimes. So what we want is the blood covering us. Okay, anyway, so now they come out of Egypt. What's one of the first things that happens when they come out of Egypt? They go to Mount Sinai. They get the Ten Commandments, <clears throat> the Law of God, the Torah. And then in Exodus 25, God says, bring gold and silver and fine linen and gold and purple and scarlet thread and ram skins, badger skins and oils and different things, and we're going to have a tabernacle. And then in Exodus 25, verse 8 and 9, and let, us make, let them make me a sanctuary that I may dwell among them. God's desire to tabernacle, right here. Let them make me a sanctuary. I want a tent out there where I'm going to live that I may dwell among them, according to the pattern I show you, okay? So here again, God wants to hang out with his people, not be on top of Mount Sinai, but in this case, build me a, tem a, a, a tabernacle, and I will come and live in that tabernacle. I will sit on the mercy seat, the lid, the cover of the ark, which is the covering for our sins, 
And remember the lid, the mercy seat, is above, higher than the Ten Commandments that are inside. Mercy triumphs over judgment. It says that somewhere in James, okay? Mercy triumphs over judgment. I think it's James. I'll put it in the notes. But anyway, so that continued on. God is now on the ground. He desires to dwell with them in his tabernacle. That lasted for many centuries. Even when they sinned, it still was there. But then came the time when David started thinking, I live in this beautiful paneled house of cedar and everything else, and my God is living in a tent with curtains? Enough of that. Nathan the prophet in 2 Samuel 7, if you want to read the story, 2 Samuel 7, Nathan the prophet says, do what's in your heart. God's with you. So they built, or at least David was not allowed to build it because he was a man of war. And God said, get it ready, get the stuff prepared. And Solomon, I think even within his name, Shalom, Shlomo, I, I think the, the meaning of peace is in there somewhere. God was going to dwell with the Israelites from his temple, not just the tabernacle, sitting on top of the mercy seat in the Holy of Holies. So God chose one nation and lived among them and gave them his presence, where we get the word Shekinah. His presence, this time in his temple in Jerusalem. Of course, his presence is in heaven. And David was inspired to say, where can I go from your Shekinah? Where can I go from your presence? If I go up to heaven, you're there. Down to earth, you're there. In the sea, you're there. But anyway, his presence was in the Holy of Holies. But in the end, Israel didn't appreciate it. They sinned. They turned against God. They defiled the temple terribly. Hezekiah and Josiah tried to clean it up. But anyway... It's a warning for us today. So God destroyed Israel up north, the ten tribes, sent them into captivity first, and later on Judah went into captivity as well, destroyed the temple built by Solomon, and then some of the Jews returned 70 years later. The warning is there for us. We have to value the temple of God, which temple we are. I'm getting ahead of myself, though. You know, during this feast, you're, you're going to all ask God to please come and be with us, inspire us, pour out your Holy Spirit, a holy anointing to the speakers. And yet, in a sense, we're all experiencing that tabernacling with God right now. So what happened next? God's desire to tabernacle. We had Adam and Eve. We had the tabernacle. We have the temple. The next thing we come to is in John. And by the way, sometimes just look up if you have a concordance or just be aware that it says so many times in the book of Jeremiah and Ezekiel especially. And then the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah saying, John says in John 1, I'm going to tell you who that word of the Lord was. John 1 verses 1 to 3. John identifies this word. In the beginning was the word. The Word was with God. The Word was God. The Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. Everything was made through Him. Nothing made that was made wasn't made unless it was through Him. So the Word that came to Isaiah, I mean to Isaiah and Jeremiah, Ezekiel and Zechariah and others, the Word that came to them was the one who became Jesus Christ. And I believe the the Word called Word, when the Word came to Jeremiah. I think that should be capitalized because I think it points to Jesus. Then the word, remember the word was God. It says, verse 14, John 1, 14, and the word became flesh. And the Young's literal translation says, and tabernacled among us. And tabernacled among us. And we beheld this glory. So then, the one who had been God, was God, was with God, came and tabernacled or dwelt with mankind. And the word was called Yeshua, meaning Savior, salvation, okay? I read that earlier. Matthew 1, 21 to Joseph, she will bear a son, he shall call his name Jesus, for he is 
He is the one who will save his people. Save. He was also called Emmanuel, God with us. As God in the flesh, God with us. Jesus did something that would have been a huge sin if while flesh on earth, he wasn't also God. I don't know that you all believe this or teach this. I teach it. Bible teach it more important, teaches it more importantly. In the flesh, while Jesus roamed the earth for 30 some years, he was God in the flesh and therefore allowed himself to be worshiped by Peter a couple of times. Peter was so amazed he worshiped him. The blind man in John 9, I think it is, uh, when he was healed, he worshiped him and so on. So uh, when, when people tried to worship Paul and Barnabas, they said, no, 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 you, we're just people like you. When they tried to worship an angel in Revelation 9, 19, verse 10, he said, no, 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 I'm just an angel. You can only worship God. Well, Jesus allowed himself to be worshiped quite a few times. And so he should, because he was God, even in the flesh. I'm talking about before his resurrection. So the word of God, who was God and with God, came and tabernacled with us, mankind, for more than 30 years. So what's the next thing that happens? While he's teaching what he's teaching, he says this in John 14, 23. He says, John 14, 23, he's taking up another level. If anyone loves me, he will keep my word and my father will love him. And we, Father, God most high, and I, Son of God, we will come to him and make our home with him. So God is now saying, I'd like you to know you're about to have company. Any of you who are not baptized, why? What's holding you back? You just have to repent and accept Jesus as your Savior. And then get baptized and receive the Holy Spirit. And if you're about to be baptized, receive the Holy Spirit, you're also about to receive company. That company is Jesus Christ and God the Father coming by the Holy Spirit inside of you. That's possible, that they will reside in us only when Jesus died on the cross for you and me. It was showing his and his father's value that they placed on you and me. That they were willing for Christ to die for you and for me. So they were to come and live inside of us. As an aside, somebody once asked, well, when do you think Yeshua is coming back? I mentioned that conversation to Carol, my wife, and her response to me was deep, rapid, to the point. Without hesitation, she said, for us in the body of Christ, he's already here, inside of us. He's come already into our hearts through faith. That's what Ephesians 3, 17 says. Christ has dwell in your hearts by faith. So God's desire for you. So in a sense, the kingdom of God is within us by Christ living in us. I don't have to explain that some difficult way. Just take the plain words for what they say. When Christ comes to live in us, like Ephesians 3, 17, and he's a rep he represents that kingdom as king of kings, then the kingdom of God is near us and in us, within us. God's desire for you and me is to have us be the first of the family. You might want to listen to my sermon called Breathtaking Destiny. Just type in two words, Breathtaking Destiny. It explains how God is having a family. And in fact, all families of the earth are named through him. So that's why Paul said, I don't live anymore. It's not me. Christ is now our life. Colossians 3, 3 and 4 says that. Christ who is now our life. In Galatians 2, 20, I've used this so many times. I don't live any longer. It's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me in the life I live. Is I live by faith in the Son of God, faith of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. Make it personal. Paul did. So how true in our lives should be 
living examples of what a life is like ruled by God's kingdom. We're still corruptible flesh, and like Paul, we still sin. Our sins should not be way of life kind of sins, though, where we're just constantly getting drunk, womanizing, lying, breaking the Sabbath, and so on. This, this shouldn't be. Our God wants into our life. He wants into our life. Why, Yeshua, why is Yeshua the king knocking at the door of the Laodiceans? I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice, opens the door, I'll come in. We'll have dinner together. Revelation 3, 2021. Don't let God, the Son of God, be outside knocking on the door of your life. Now we not only have him knocking on our door and being in us, we're also in God. That's a little harder to understand. But we're in God because we're in Christ. God the Father and God the Son not only want to come live in us, they want us to come live in them. Live in them. Colossians 3, verses 2 to 4. Set your mind on things above, not on things of the earth. For you died. When we were baptized, we went into the death of Christ. We were crucified with him. We died with him. And we came back up, not just a new us, because we still sinned. We come up as a new resurrection in Christ. Romans 6, verses 3 to 6. For you died, but now your life is hidden with Christ in God. Got that? When Christ, who is our life, appears, then you'll appear with him in glory. So though I may still sin and you may still sin, the life, you guys have got to come to see this and accept it. Most of you who hear me don't accept this or understand this. You died. The life God sees now, if you have been baptized and received the Holy Spirit, is not you and all your sins. He sees Christ. And that way there is no condemnation. Romans 8, 1. How can you condemn Christ? It was perfect. So Paul says in Romans 7, even when I sin, it's no longer I who sin, but the old me, the old sin that dwells in me. He says, I hate that part of me. Who's going to deliver me from this body of death? Then Romans 8, 1. There's now no condemnation in Christ Jesus our Lord. None. So anyway, Colossians 3, verse 4, when Christ, who is our life, when Christ, who is our life, appears, then you'll appear with him in glory. So you're not only having them abide in you, you're abiding in them as well because of being in Christ. 1 John 4, verses 15 and 16. Whoever confesses Jesus is the Son of God, God abides in him and he in God. And when and we have known and believed the love that God has for us, God is love. And he who abides in love abides in God. And God in him. He who abides in love abides in God. Did you realize that? You live in God. You might say, but I'm too sinful to live in God. Well, it's not you living in God. Did you not follow what I just read? In Colossians 3, when Christ, who is our life, and in verse 3, I mean, where you died, your life is hidden with Christ in God. Christ is perfect. That's how we're in God. So anyway, now God is tabernacling with us because we're called the temple of God. When someone, and when someone comes to visit, we know God's coming to visit. What do we do when we know someone's coming to visit? We clean house. I pick up all the plates and glasses in my bed and so on, take it back to the kitchen. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> we prepare, we clean house, we tidy up. Now God Almighty is coming to live in us, so clean up. Jesus cleaned up the temple of his Father. What kind of clean, glorious temple are we presenting for God? Now, if we don't, we still will be saved, but our reward level will be really low. Okay? Even the man who had sinned in 1 Corinthians 5 
turn him over to Satan for the destruction of the flesh, that his spirit may be saved in the day of our Lord. He would have had various, very, very small reward, but he would have been there. Giving Satan, I'm sorry, giving a sermon in the future about how he must overcome. That overcoming has to be by Christ and in Christ. The other thing that happens when people live together, they really come to know each other very well. We are now in God. We are supposed to be understanding him better. He is now in us. That means everything my eye sees, he sees. Everything I touch, he touches. Every place I go, he goes. I want you to be very aware of that. When I'm aware of that, my sin level is way lower, if at all. When I forget that is when trouble happens. Don't make God watch something he would not want to watch. Don't make God go someplace he would not want to go. Over time, you do risk him, not immediately, but you do risk him over time leaving. Take not your spirit from me, O God. Renew a right spirit in me. Create in me a clean heart, O God. Words David said in Psalm 51. So your every fear he knows, your every worry he feels. And Father is going to someday give you a new name. Several new names. New assignments. He'll explain that you had to go through the pain and ugly suffering you did so that you could be ready for this because it's through suffering that even Jesus was made perfect, complete by the things which he suffered. Hebrews 2.10 Hebrews 5, verse 7 and 9 and other verses that say he was made perfect by the things he suffered. That's the same for us. Now, something else. There's a time when Jesus said, destroy this temple in three days, I'll rebuild it. Another time when he talked to the children of Abraham, who claimed to be children of Abraham, Jesus said to them, I could raise up stones to be children of Abraham. Well, Peter clarifies in 1 Peter 2.5, you also as living stones are being built up a spiritual house, a holy priesthood. By the time of Christ walking the earth, the priesthood was defiled terribly. It's very political. If you had enough money, you could buy the priesthood. You could buy the high priesthood. They weren't necessarily even all descendants of Aaron. Well, God's starting a new priesthood. You and me. We're being built up as living stones into a new house, a holy temple. 1 Peter 2, verse 9 and 10, you are chosen. You are, are a chosen generation. Not will be in the millennium, as I understood it for years. I'm being prepared to be royalty. I'm being prepared to be a priest. I don't see it that way anymore. God says, hey, you're a priest now. You're royal now. Live like a royal, not like a commoner. You are a chosen generation. You are a royal priesthood. Now, a holy nation, his own special people, that you may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. You once were nobody. Now you are somebody. That's just me paraphrasing it. So 1 Peter 2.9 says, Right now we're a royal priesthood in Christ no longer condemned, to declare his praises. Now, 1 Corinthians 3, verses 16 to 17, Do you not know you are the temple of God, and that the Spirit of God dwells in you? If, this is what makes us a temple of God. If anyone defiles the temple of God, God will destroy him. For the temple of God is holy, which temple you are. God's coming to visit us, to live in us. When we have company, we clean house. 
He wants to come and live in you and me permanently. Jesus Christ, my commander and Lord, is coming to stay. King Hezekiah got this. King Josiah got this. You can go back and read the stories in 2 Kings 18 and 2 Kings 22. These two kings cleaned house. They had brought in pagan idols and horrible garbage into the temple of God. And they cleaned house. It's time we cleaned house. Me too. It's time for us to present our areas of sin that we say to God, I don't want to keep doing this. I don't want to keep being like this. Let Christ live in me. Come and be in me. In my constant contact program, if I do it, I'm doing it more and more. Hope Go back and hear the sermon, Constant Contact. Throughout the day, I say often now, Holy Jesus, I'm opening my door to you. I'm asking you to come and live in me. I'm asking you to make me a better husband. I'm such a poor husband. God, change me. I'm such a poor person. Change me. Make me be someone you're smiling about. Change me. Come inside of me. I can't change myself. The sacrifice of Jesus Christ and his life is enough. It's more than enough. I've just got to let him in. Let him lead. Let me follow. The Lord is the Spirit. I don't want to defile your temple. Help me overcome where I need to overcome. We cannot let old sins have safe harbor in our lives. I'm guilty of that sometimes. All too often I take the presence of God for granted. At times in my life I got careless in the house of God, which is my life. I'm that house of God. I'm that temple. So please, all of us, let's seek him more. And he's enough to make us realize we don't have to go around condemning ourselves all the time. That's what Paul had to learn. I'm no longer condemned. Romans 8, verse 4, 3 and 4. The righteous requirements of the law were fulfilled by Christ. I'm asking for that to be placed on me. Romans 5, verse 17. The gift of God's righteousness we get to receive. A lot of you aren't believing that. I, I wish you would. It's all there in Romans 3, 4, 5. You know, read those chapters over and over at the end of Romans 4. That these promises of God giving righteousness to Abraham weren't for him only, but for us also who believe. Philippians 3, verse 8, 9, and 10. I don't want my own righteousness, which is from the law. I don't want it. But the righteousness of God through faith in Christ. Philippians 3, verse 9 and 10. Go back and read those. Read them. We're royal priests right now. Priest. We're a holy nation right now. Let's not be acting like the rest of the world. Let's not be like that. We're royalty. So look at your life. Where are we sloppy? Sabbath keeping? Lusting? Anger? Hot temper? Where, where do we need to change? So this is really what God's tabernacling with us is all about. We really get to know someone we live with. Ask God to let him see a changing you, an overcoming you, the life of Jesus more and more. John 3.30, John the Baptist said, Jesus, he must increase. I must decrease. I don't care if all of my disciples go follow him. That's what it's supposed to be. He must be more of him and less of me. Well, in our lives, let's let it be that way. More of him, less of me. Seeing and foretelling the end from the beginning. Let's end this with Revelation 21, verse 1 and 2. Revelation 21, 1 and 2. I saw a new heaven, new earth. This is after the millennium. This is after the Feast of Tabernacles. Well into the eighth day at this point, okay? New beginnings. I saw a new heaven, new earth. The whole meaning of eight is new. For the first heaven, the first earth had passed away. I think we're going to get a whole new planet. I really do. I don't agree with some who teach that it's just 
I'm going to clean up the surface of this planet. We might end up with a planet that will make Jupiter look small. I mean, I mean, a city with 1,500 miles high? Mount Everest is six miles high. 1,500 miles high? I'll need to put those in kilometers in the, my notes for my Kenyan brethren. Also, there's no more sea. Then I, John, saw the holy city, a new Jerusalem, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride for her husband. That's our city. That's why it's even called the bride here. That's our city. The others will have other cities. Revelation 21, 3. And I heard a loud voice from heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men. And he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people. The tabernacle of God is with men. That's my title. God's desire to tabernacle with us all. So remember that as you come to the feast. This is all temporary. The universe is temporary. The feast is temporary. The millennium is temporary. Our bodies are temporary. God demands a holy house to live in. <clears throat> invite him in. Invite him to clean us up. Invite him to help us overcome, resist sin, to let his mind rule us. Let this mind be in you. Let it be in you. I don't want to be tempted. I don't want to have angers. And I don't want to be all these things. And what power and glory we should have that we could be demonstrating if we really would let the Holy Spirit and God's presence, His Shekinah presence, shine in us. So I recommend you hear my sermon also in constant contact, inviting Christ in frequently. Have a wonderful remainder of the Feast of Tabernacles, or whenever you're hearing this. And enjoy the presence of our God, Most High, in Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we come to you now at the end of this sermon. We ask you to please do be with the people at the Feast of Tabernacles all through it. Let your anointing, a Holy Spirit, just flow freely and powerfully. Let us be a joy for you. Please come and live inside us. Please, as we raise our hands up to you and asking you to reach down and grab us and hold us and hug us and accept us, Live in us. Be our mind. Let your words be our words. Let your mind and conduct be our conduct. Let us be changing. Let us not be like the world. Let us be like Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Yeshua, our King. We ask you now to dismiss us. We thank you so much for all your blessings. We ask for your protection, your guidance, and your Holy Spirit in vast amounts. In Yeshua, Jesus' mighty name. Amen. <laughs> Visit the Light on the Rock website where you can view additional videos, over 600 sermons and blogs as a scriptural study reference for those who desire to have a closer relationship with God the Father and His Son Jesus Christ and learn more about His incredible plan for all mankind. We are not a church, but a nonprofit organization providing in-depth biblical studies free for all who would like to visit our site. The Light on the Rock Foundation also supports an orphanage in Kenya, providing financial resources to support their living costs and education. We never ask for money. However, any donations are greatly appreciated and will be used to support the Kenyan orphanage and our site. Thank you for visiting, and if you find the site beneficial to you and your family, please share with others.